Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Co-op. This morning, we have the great pleasure of having Deb Trocher on with us this morning. Good morning, Deb. Good morning, Vernon. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And you are the Executive Director of the Indiana Cooperative Development Center. What is that? We are one of a handful, uh, when I say handful, about 30-ish co-op development centers across the country who are funded by USDA Rural Development to provide a number of services to people, communities, individuals who want to start cooperatives or expand cooperatives. Okay, so it could be any type of cooperative that you would work on developing or expanding? Yes, any type. And each state co-op development center will have a little bit different focus, but a lot of us focus very broadly, and that's the case here in Indiana. Okay. So do you have a particular focus in what you what kind of co-op do you work with? Not really, but we tend to work with a lot of ag co-ops, food cooperatives. I would love to see an increase in the number of worker co-ops out there. And then um, this newest initiative that we're going to talk about this morning, housing cooperatives. Okay. So ag co-ops, food co-ops, worker co-ops and now housing okay that's a lot do you have you know you have a hundred people on your staff you're looking at the staff <laughs> okay i know, <laughs> I know. you do all, of this, do all of this by yourself and whatever volunteer work you can get and i have lots of volunteers and helpers yes fantastic fantastic so, Deb, right off, how would people get a hold of you if they want to find out about how to create a co-op or expand their co-op? How would they get a hold of you? The easiest way is to go to the website, um, which is www.icdc.coop, and there is a form you can fill out that gets automatically emailed to me. You can email me at dtrocha at icdc.coop, or you can call me at 317-692-7707. Okay. So that webpage, www.icdc, and that stands for Indiana Cooperative Development Center, dot coop, dot co-op. Okay. So you can work with all of these different types of co-ops, ag, food, worker, housing, I normally talk to you about food co-ops if you're up and coming. Uh, how did you get into that? That's people that want to start a food co-op. But that's national. That's not just in Indiana. Right. We started that program back in 2010, and I was partnering with Blooming Foods, which is a food co-op in Bloomington. We were both getting all kinds of calls and requests for assistance to start food co-ops, and I approached the general manager about, why don't we – pool our resources and start this little training event, which was intended to just be a little regional event, started with 50 people, and over time, it gained some recognition, and some of the consultants that we used as speakers, whose opinion I valued, uh, Bill Gessner, who's no longer with us, said uh, after we were, had been in business maybe five or six years, it was probably time to take it national. So it's now national in scope, and uh, this this year we'll be in St. Paul, Minnesota for the very first time in September, the 14th through the 16th at the Intercontinental. There is a blurb on the website. We don't have a lot of details yet. Um, when those become available, you'll be able to find them on the website as well. So we're excited about it. The Twin Cities have a ton of co-ops, have a lot of food co-ops too. So we're really excited to have all the startup 
or a lot of the startup food co-ops in St. Paul. So you started with 50 people. How many do you expect uh, or have you had in recent uh, history? 300. 300? Yeah, there's a lot of interest across the country in um, food co-ops, especially, say, a community that grocery stores have left. Happens a lot in, in urban communities as well as in small rural communities uh, where the downtowns, you know, start losing businesses one after the other. And when the food co- uh, when the grocery store leaves, that really leaves a hole in the community. So there's quite a lot of interest in um, food co-ops these days. Okay. So food co-ops come in and wherever there's a void in the marketplace, they can fill that void because the individuals own the business. Correct. Okay. Not some corporate <laughs> corporation. corporation. Somewhere. And amazingly, during COVID, because food co-ops tend to get a lot of their products local, they didn't face a lot of the same shortages uh. that the big corporate grocery stores did, who had supply chain issues. Not to say that food co-ops didn't have some of that as well, but they were able to weather the storm and did a lot of things to ensure that their um, customers and members um, had access. Fantastic, fantastic. So you've been doing a lot of work since 2010 with food co-ops, and yes. now for the first time you're starting to work for housing co-ops. So what is that? what are you doing in housing co-ops? Well, this isn't our first rodeo with housing co-ops. We tried to generate interest. The first time that we did a little conference and tried to, to gain some interest across the state, um, it was right before the big crisis in 2008. Okay. So nobody was interested in building houses then. And in talking with uh, one of my board members who works with our um, economic developers across the state, what they are seeing is, in particular, for employers who are looking to expand, grow their employee base, they're having a difficult time hiring people one reason being that there's not enough housing stock in the community. And add on top of that, um, all of the issue with the pent-up demand from COVID, prices going through the roof, both on the rental side as well as on the ownership side. And I could fairly say that there's a housing crisis in Indiana. And our um, there was a study done in, was le- released in 2022 that uh, actually in 2021, the Indiana University Public Policy Institute looked at overall the issues that are facing Indiana communities, and one of the top three was housing. Let's see, 74% of respondents said that affordable housing was a critical challenge. So I would say that qualifies as Mm -hmm. crisis. Okay. All right, Deb, how did you get into co-ops? kind of an interesting story. Uh, I moved to the state and worked in small business development. And um, there were a group of people who were interested in accessing the USDA Rural Development, Rural Cooperative Development Grant for the state of Indiana. And I was part of a group of people who sat around a table and talked about that um, I was part of the first board of directors for the Co-op Development Center, and we started with the grant in 2003 using a fiscal agent, and by 2006, we were incorporated. The director that we hired, interestingly enough, had come out of housing and wanted to go back into housing. I was looking to make a change, and um, the stars aligned, Okay. and I became the director of the Co-op Development Center. But what piqued your interest about co-ops, period? I mean, you, you're on this group trying to figure out how to get some money from the Department of Agriculture, but what caused you to want to do co-op? Because when I went through school, I was never taught about this thing called co-op. Uh, correct, and neither was I. I have an MBA, so nothing came up. You know, in small business development, you're working with, sole proprietors, occasionally partnerships, or, you know, small business. But the difference between that and working with cooperatives is that it's a group of people who come together who have identified some need, some shared need, and they've decided that we're going to solve 
this need ourselves. We're not going to wait for somebody else to come along and do it for us. It's very democratic. Everybody has a say in how the organization is run. It operates at, I don't want to say totally at cost because they have to make a profit, but that's not the motivator. Right. It's meeting the needs of the members. That's what motivates and drives a co-op. So the shift goes from purely a money thing to money being important, but not the driver. And there's not some entity out there telling you what you can and cannot do in your business. The members make that decision. They have a lot of power. So it's putting the power back to the people, if you will, going back to my days in the 70s. So it, it's putting that ability to guide the organization, make decisions for it where it should be, which is with the people who own the business. So I have, I learned about co-ops when I was managing housing co-ops in Washington, D.C. Before that, I knew nothing about co-ops. And I had been a member of a credit union, but did not know it was a co-op. So I'm, I'm going, that I know when I learned about them. When did you learn about them? So when I was growing up, I grew up in Alabama, in the country, and we got our electricity from a rural electric cooperative. And in high school, and they still do it to this day, and that's a long time ago, the Rural Electrics have a youth tour to Washington. Oh. And in our school, you had to submit an essay. And then they chose a boy and a girl to represent our high school, or to represent the state of, of Alabama, and uh, made a trip to Washington, met our elected officials. Um, so that's kind of where I first... It first clicked with me what a co-op was, and then there's a long period of time in between when I really got more involved. Oh, fantastic. So high school in Alabama, and somehow you migrated from Alabama to Indiana. We won't go there right now. But you learn about it with rural electric co-ops, and most people, I, I live in, in uh, Prince George's County and around Washington, D.C., and I paid my electric bill to a rural electric but I didn't know it was a co-op. Okay. I had no idea it was a co-op. So that's, that's extremely interesting that now this is not a rural electric, not in Prince George's County anymore. Like in, in Fairfax, Virginia, there's a rural electric co-op. But it used to be rural, but not rural anymore around as, as Washington has grown out. Okay. So I'm also wanting to talk about the theme this month is Women's History Month. And that's celebrating women who tell the stories of women's history and I want to talk to you about women who have been in this housing world when we come back out for our break so we're going to take our first break Deb and we'll be right back to talk more about your conference and Women's History Month we'll be right back News Talk 1450 WOLAM Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative, and we're call, talking to Deb Trocher this morning out of Indiana, uh, Indianapolis to be exact, and we're talking about a conference that is coming up at the end of this month. Is how to use the co-op model to address the housing crisis, and we're talking about the housing crisis in Indiana. So you mentioned why there's a housing crisis, the uh, cost of housing have gone up and even if uh, an employee wanted to hire somebody to bring them into Indiana there's no no housing the housing shortage so can you talk a little bit more well let me ask you this question what's the average income for Indiana because for Washington DC is right around a hundred thousand dollars but what's the medium housing we don't income we don't come close to that about sixty two thousand seven hundred and forty two dollars Okay, so if somebody's making uh, half of that uh, in D.C., again, it's 50000 but in Indiana, that would be $31,000. And I just did some quick math, and I find out that HUD says that one should spend about 30% of their income for housing. And if somebody's 50% of the median family income in Indiana, they should be spending about $784 for housing. 30% of their income that's per on a monthly basis. That's my quick math. So let's call it $800. Okay. 
can you get a, a decent house in Indiana or Indianapolis particularly for $800? I think you would be hard-pressed. Um, I, I looked up real quickly this morning the average rent, and this is in Indianapolis, not around the state, but just in Indianapolis, so the rents will be a little bit higher. The average rent was between $1,100 and $1,400. Okay, so if somebody was coming in and making the average income, they could not afford that, and that's by definition a crisis. Yeah. yeah. And there are some, um, Indiana is fortunate, we do have some affordable housing cooperatives in Indianapolis that might work for an individual who was at 50% of the median household income. But the trick there is, um, and I spoke to my good friend, uh, Frankie Morton, who is the uh, board chair at Mayfield Green Housing Cooperative. They stay about 98, 99% occupied. So the chances of being able to even get into that, you're beyond a waiting list. Well, that's what's happening around the, the nation with housing co-ops. And I got to tell you, when when I first heard the term limited equity housing co-ops, I thought that was white folks trying to make sure that black folks didn't get any wealth. Limited equity means no wealth, and I didn't I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And this is going back in the late '80s when I was had begun to start managing housing co-ops, and I heard this term. And this developer was trying to create housing co-ops. But since I've been in this business now for 30-some years, in the housing co-op business, it is so much better than the option. The alternative is an apartment building or homelessness. Okay? Right. In a housing co-op with limited equity means there's some equity. Okay? In an apartment, there's no equity. So I've become to really love it for that reason, but a whole lot of reasons that we're going to talk about here today. And that's basically, and just let me ask you this right now, what's the advantage of a co-op while you want to address the crisis with co-ops as opposed to apartment buildings? As with any type of co-op, the members, the people who actually own the cooperative, run the cooperative. It's a very democratic organization, one member, one vote. So the people who are living in that housing co-op make the decisions about how to operate. Now, they, they may have a management team or a management company, but still it's the board of directors who live in the co-op who make those decisions. Um, and as I had mentioned to you earlier, early in my career at the center, I was really interested in seeing some senior housing cooperatives. So I took a tour of a number of senior housing co-ops in the Twin Cities. <clears throat> and it's absolutely fascinating. I got to visit the one of the first housing co-ops, that senior housing co-ops that was built. It was a high-rise. But the beauty of it was I met one of the first board of directors who was 90-something years old. Mm. And when you think about it, you know, we talk about the fact that, you know, our seniors – how do you keep them active? How do you keep their mental acuity where it needs to be? Living in a housing co-op kind of helps solve all of that because you, if you decide to run for the board, you are running that co-op for the benefit of your members or others who live in that co-op, which is so cool. So there's not only that ability to you know, keep that mental acuity going, but there's also all kinds of social interaction that happens in a co-op. Mm-hmm. So an, another issue for seniors is, you know, they feel isolated. They feel lonely. You don't have to be lonely in a housing co-op unless you choose to be. But, you, yes. but there are all kinds of opportunities to have that social engagement and then also to be as involved as you want to be in the running of the co-op. So I didn't expect to talk about this, but what you just hit on, I've just finished reading a book. Well, I got it on Audible. It's Younger Next Year is the title. How can you be younger next year than you are? And it was written for people 40, 50, 60s. But I'm giving it to, I'm talking to everybody. I don't care what age. And the third, you know, they talk about exercise and diet is the top two things for being younger next year. But the third one is this sort of commitment and community and social engagement. 
uh, having something that you that you want to work towards, some something that's bigger than you, keeping active and to keep in dementia down is keeping that brain working. Uh, mm-hmm. Not getting Alzheimer's is one of the big things. So I'm 75, so I'm very much <laughs> into figuring out how I don't get dementia. How you know, how do you <laughs> how you stay alert? And that is being active, and that's what you get with cooperation. Okay, phenomenal. There are seven co-op principles, and you've already mentioned a couple of those. A democratic control, the uh, autonomy and independence is the fourth one. Democratic control is the second one. Do you know right offhand the first? The first oh, one? Yeah. It's up on my business card. Oh, you have um, your business card. Okay. I have them on my business card. Voluntary and open membership. So the, the, first the housing co-op would be open to anybody regardless of race or age. Well, if it's a senior, they'll have some age limitations, but it doesn't care about your politics or your religion or anything. It's just open. And you mentioned democratic member control, one member, one vote. The third one is member economic participation. So what is that one? So the kind of way I look at it is there's there's an economic component to cooperatives on the front end. There's usually some kind of a membership buy-in, share. So you become a part owner of the business. And then on the back side of that, less than a housing co-op, but if say you're in a consumer co-op, you're a member of a food co-op. The more business that you do at the co-op, at the end of the year, the business is, if the co-op is profitable, the board makes a decision to return some of that profit back to the members. So it's based on how much business you do. Oh, I'm co-op. sorry. You're telling me that if I go to a grocery store, I'm going to get money back? <laughs> Absolutely. If it's and a co-op. Right, and it's yeah. called patronage, yes. If it's a co-op, <laughs> you won't get that at your local Kroger. <laughs> okay. And so that's the third principle. And the fourth one is on your business that Autonomy card? and independence. Okay. That we talked a little about. Education, training, and information. That's critical, not only internal to the co-op. So it's making the, the board and the people who are running the co-op need to ensure that their members understand what's happening in the business. Right? So mm-hmm. it's important that You communicate with the members, um, making sure that they understand that, hey, you're part of a co-op. You are part owner of this business. So so there's the internal education, and then there's the external education to the community, making sure that the community understands that you're a co-op. And um, that kind of ties in to the the next two. I don't know if you want to go there now or not. Go ahead. So um, principle is called P6, Cooperation Among Co-ops. So if you want to, one of the cool things about the Food Co-op Conference that we do is people share ideas. So if you call another startup co-op and say, I want to see how you put your financials together, they're going to share that. If you are Kroger and you want to talk to another major grocery store and want to see their financials, I don't think you're going to get the same response. I'm pretty sure you're not going to. That's <laughs> the difference between cooperation and and co-ops, and we're going to take our next break. But you hit on the the fifth principle is what I first learned to love co-ops, this education, training, and information, and watching everyday people run a housing co-op or a food co-op, maybe have a high school degree, maybe not. We both have MBAs, and you don't have to get an MBA to learn how to manage this business because you're getting this data through this training that people talk about we're going to come back and talk about seven principle and i'm still wanting to get to who are some of these co-op heroes that are women and what are their stories we'll be right back please don't touch that down this is wol news talk 1450 am welcome back everybody this is vernon oaks and the program is everything co-op and deb trocher is our guest today we're talking about a conference that's coming up on March 31st. It is about housing co-ops solving the housing crisis in Indiana. She is the executive director of the Indiana Cooperative Development Center, ICDC. And if you want to get information about this conference, you would go to their webpage, www.icdc.coop. 
And Deb, uh, the National Co-op Bank has sponsored our show. Now we're into our 10th year. This October will be, we've been 10 years on the air. We started and we were only going to do it for one month and that's the month of October, which is co-op month. And I like it and people like being on it and NCB has liked helping us and they've been a great, great partner. And NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. So, Deb, have you have you asked NCB to be a part of this housing co-op? Because you're talking about, about affordable housing, and that's normally in low-income communities. It doesn't have to be in low-income. It could be in sort of just average income because of the crisis but have you have they have you talked to them about maybe helping to do some funding for what you're coming up with absolutely um i reached out to my good friends there and they are providing the funding which will allow us to live stream the conference oh so they're helping with the conference okay yes yes they will be you can either come to the conference in person if you live in the area or um it will be live streamed as well so when you register um, right before the conference, like the day before, I'll send you a link, and you can participate virtually. So I'm excited. This is a small enough conference that we can make that work. Okay. So before we get into the content of the conference, what's the seventh principle? We talked about the first six before the break. So what's the seventh principle? Concern for community. So wait a minute. I thought, I, I'm sorry. I, I just thought businesses were going to Concerned about making money. I'm the, what do you mean concerned? Not co-ops. <laughs> <laughs> co-ops, to be fair, co-ops are businesses, and they do need to be profitable to stay in business. However, profit is not the main driver, the main motivator. That's their members are the main motivator. But co-ops are part of the community. They hire local people. They obviously pay wages. They pay taxes. They get involved in the community, um, in community events. Maybe they sponsored a little league, or if there's some kind of a uh, an event happening in the community, oftentimes you will find the local co-ops are involved in that as well. So they're very much community rooted, community minded. You know, they're they're part of the community. If the if the community is successful and thriving, it kind of stands to reason that so would the co-op be thriving and successful. So I have it throughout these years that co-ops are first concerned about people, their members, their members' families, the people in the community. Their second concern with that community is the planet, and the third concern is profit. So it's three Ps, this people, planet, profit, is what co-ops are really, really concerned about. Okay, so those are the seven principles. Those are the guides. And I like the values of co-ops, particularly the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. Do the co-ops that you work with, do they use these values? Oh, absolutely. And they may not voice all of them, but when you look at the business that they're creating and how they're going about it, these all kind of rise to the surface. The self-help, self-responsibility you know, when people identify an issue that they're trying to solve, they're not waiting for somebody somebody to come in on a white horse and fix it for them. They're doing it themselves. Okay. No, I, I, I got that. I just, when you said white horse, most of the time it's white men that are in power play. So it's not a white man coming in on a white horse to solve whatever the community problem is. People decide yeah. they're going to fix the problem through cooperation. And so that's why I like it also. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So now I want to turn it to your conference and uh, using the housing co-op model to address the housing crisis. And you said that's on Friday, March the 31st, the last day of this month, right? Last, yeah, right. last day of this month. What are you going to talk about? What's your agenda like? So we're going to open the day with um, one of my colleagues from Michigan, Brian Donovan, who is with the cooperative group. He has a lot of experience in housing co-ops. Uh, he 
was involved in a lot of housing co-ops in Austin, Texas. And he's going to set the stage and talk about, first of all, what is co-op? Mm-hmm. We want to make sure everybody understands the model, first and foremost, and then talk about housing co-ops, the different types of housing co-ops. That, because there's more than one model. Um, the benefits to them, how they operate. Then we're going to have a panel of uh, two women and a, a young man um, to talk about the two women are um, developers and helped organize cooperatives. So they have a bird's eye view of what it really looks like, what it takes to start a cooperative. Then after lunch, we're going to talk about, well, the panel will be right after lunch, and then we're going to talk about um, financing. So so you want to start a housing co-op, well, how do you finance it, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It's a little bit different than the traditional, you know, I'm going out to buy a house individually. And, and again, NCB will be participating, Jarrell Duffy, um, we'll be making that presentation. And then we're going to wrap it up with um, Jake Sipe, who is with the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, and talking about kind of wrapping it all up and putting a bow on it, how you connecting the dots with housing co-ops. Okay. So we want to give people a taste of housing cooperatives, pique their interest, and hopefully from that we will get individuals, communities who are interested in exploring further and perhaps um, starting a housing co-op in their communities. So to start at 10 o'clock in the morning? And yes. On Friday? Eastern. Eastern time, 10 o'clock Eastern. And what time do you think it will be over? I um, hope to wrap it up by 3. And just a reminder, um, you can attend in person, but also I have a number of people who are registered who will be uh, participating virtually. There's still time to register. There's no cost to register. Wait a minute, no cost? Um, no cost? No cost. No cost. But I do need to know, I, you do need to register so that if you're in person, I can have enough food. Or if you're going to um, participate virtually, you can get the link to the live stream. So it's no cost and you're going to provide food for no cost too? Yes. Wow, okay. I'm committed to getting some housing co-ops in Indiana. <laughs> okay, okay. And the reason for that, one more time, why do you want housing co-ops in Indiana? It provides opportunities for people who thought that the American dream of home ownership was beyond their reach. And as I mentioned, there are a number of different types of housing co-ops, affordable, market rate, limited equity. There is a housing co-op for everybody if that's the choice that they make. And I've also seen I've seen single family homes be a housing mm-hmm. co-op in, in, a, in an area a group of people come together and, and buy single family homes I've also seen garden style co-ops uh, housing that's a co-op garden style maybe no more than three levels because they're walk-ups and so forth normally around two right. and then I've seen as you said high rise um, with elevators and I don't know 20 floors 30 floors 50 floors in New York, it might be a hundred floors. Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> that that go up. And there's also a college model, college campus model. We won't particularly be talking about that um, on the 31st, but there's also housing co-ops on college campuses. Not all, but some. And I've had some people on the show that have talked about they learn more about people and leadership in their housing co-ops than they did in their classrooms. Um, that that experience of working with people and solving problems and all of that. All right, so let's talk about one of these co-op heroes or women that have a story. Who do you like to talk about first? The 2023 inductee into the Cooperative Hall of Fame is Linda Leakes. And she is, if you go to the Cooperative Development Foundation's website, which is cdf.coop, you can read about all the inductees. And Linda was dubbed the godmother of D.C. housing cooperatives, Oh, which is just wow. I've never heard um, that title. I know her well. She's a phenomenal lady, very quiet, very laid back, and get things done. Okay? Yeah. Uh, she walks softly and carries a big stick, Linda Leakes. And she's going to be inducted this year, right, 2023, Correct. into the Hall of Fame? In October. Mm-hmm. So she is African American. She's been working hard at creating uh, co-ops in the D.C. area. 
It's interesting you start with her. And um, anything else about her? Well, I found it fascinating in reading about her. Um, so she started an organization called WISH, just the Washington Inner City Self Help. Again, self help. Cooperatives are all about that. And the whole point was to help organize tenants to form limited equity housing co ops to maintain their homes. So that's one really cool thing about her. But then in the 90s, she started helping create housing cooperatives in Johannesburg, South Africa. I didn't even know that. Okay. Isn't that cool? Hmm. No, I didn't know that about her. I When I met her, uh, it was through Wish. Uh, so it's the 80s. Um, okay. One other kind of interesting thing, not only did she help start the housing co-ops, but she also created complementary businesses, cooperative businesses. So a management cooperative to help manage the housing co-ops and then um, janitorial services to service the co-ops. I mean, you know, when you think about it, there's all kinds of ancillary services that you need for a housing co-op. So she was had enough foresight to think about how can we look at some of those services and create a co-op out of that as well. Fantastic. Okay, so I, I would also like to send people to www.heroes.coop. That's Co-op Heroes to get right to the, the uh, Co-op Heroes and I just turned to that, and Linda Leakes is the first person in that uh, group of co-op heroes. Okay. So she did Johannesburg, going to South Africa and starting co-ops there. I didn't know that about her history. That's that's phenomenal. Okay. Just the one little line in there, so I don't know anything more than that, but it just, to me, sounded fascinating. People tend to think, we think in a bubble when we think about as, as Americans, we think about our country. We don't typically think about, you know, our vision doesn't expand beyond that. But cooperatives come in all shapes and sizes, any industry you can imagine, and around the world. So it's okay. not unusual for someone to, you know, help start a co-op in another country. Yeah, I was saying she's real laid back, real easy. You don't know there's much going on there. And she's just powerful and gets a lot done. Uh, we're going to take our next break. And, boy, the hour's almost gone. <laughs> okay. We, we'll be right back. and We'll talk about more heroes. And I really want to tell people again about the using housing co-op models. We'll be right back. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power. Welcome back, everybody. Um, Deb Trocher is our guest today, and the theme for this month is Women's History Month. It's celebrating women who tell our stories. So, uh, Deb, we talked about Linda Leakes right before we went back. So can you tell us one other female story around housing co-ops? Yeah, this next person is also in the Cooperative Hall of Fame. Actually, it's she and her husband, Eva Rappaport. They were inducted in 2005, and they were influential leaders in New York okay. and I think we're all aware of how expensive housing is in New York they were um, leaders of the Federation of the New York housing cooperatives for more than 30 years and Eva was the executive director so not only were they involved in this association but they also were involved at a political level to help convince Congress to create the Cooperative Management Housing Insurance Fund as well as getting or persuading Congress to authorize mortgage programs aimed at creating housing co-ops for low-income families. Okay. And they had a lot of money available through HUD. There's not that much anymore. So we've got to get some more Eva Rappaport's around to help persuade Congress to put more money into developing housing co-ops for all the reasons you've talked about here, the benefits of housing co-ops over anything else. And um, there's a woman now that uh, is running that organization. You want to tell us about her? Yes, Mary Ann Rothman. Yes. Yes. Mary Ann is a fixture in the co-op 
world. She served on numerous national boards, the National Co-op Business Association, National Co-op Bank. She's running the Council of New York Cooperatives. Um, I've met her. I don't know her well, but I believe you do, Vernon. Mm -hmm. She is a force to be reckoned with. Again, another one of those quiet, laid-back people who gets a lot done. Yes, I met her through the National Association of Housing Co-ops, and she's been on that board. She's been on NCB's board, and the largest group of co-ops in the U.S. is in New York, and she managed and worked with, with them. And again, very quiet. I've gone up to their conference, their training conference, and it is very powerful, and I've learned a lot about the co-ops in New York and housing co-ops, so it is, it's excellent. Now, because of time, can you go back and tell us when is this conference, again, that you're going to have? It's Friday, March the 31st, from 10 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And I know we just changed time, so make sure you note that it is Eastern Time if you happen to be someplace outside of Indiana. Okay. And it's also Daylight Savings Time, and that gets some people... I had a person yesterday was still having trouble because they were in Arizona and they don't change daylight savings. And so it makes it even inter more interesting to try to figure out where people are. Uh, but this is, you can do it online or in person. Correct. I just need for you to register. Um, if you go to the website, www.icdc.coop, all the information, the speakers, their bios, photos, the agenda, registration site is there. So please register. If you're in person or even if, if you do it virtually, there's no charge. But I need for you to register so that those who are participating virtually can get the link. And I'll send that out um, in an email probably the day before. Okay, so I just, I've just gone to your web page. And, I and if you go to upcoming events. Okay. Okay, it says housing co-op conferences pop right up. And then it says register here. So yes. you can go register. And use, okay, I see all of the pictures of the speakers. Okay. So I see all of the pictures, and then I can register. And I find it interesting you can do this at no cost and even provide food. Okay, you have to tell me your secrets there. Okay. <laughs> Careful budgeting. What do you expect somebody will walk away with after being in this conference? <clears throat> I'm hoping that for people who aren't familiar with co-ops, that they will have an understanding of the model itself. And for people who are particularly interested in housing, whether they are in the development field, whether they're an individual who's looking for housing, whether they're in the political realm, that there's an understanding that the co-op housing model could be an answer for their community, for their state. It doesn't work for everybody, but it is a model that has worked very well for a lot of people, gives people access that thought the American dream for them was not attainable of home, home ownership. And I'm hoping that we'll see some new housing co-op projects started, not only here in Indiana, but um, across the country. I've got um, people registered from other states as well. So I'm hoping that this provides that boost, that injection of information and some excitement about this housing co-op model. Okay. And the National Association of Housing Co-ops, I'm on the Development and Preservation Committee and they know about this conference, too, so I, I'm expecting them to spread the word nationally about this conference and people can come in and get a taste of what is it like to have a housing co-op and to start one. Now, you talked about funding. You're going to talk about funding. So money seems like that's been the main reason that housing co-ops stopped being developed when HUD money's dried up. So how do you uh, do you have a sense of what Jarrell is going to be talking about on the money side? I know that NCB, um, that's one of their main pushes, one of their main areas of emphasis is in housing. And Jake is not going to particularly talk about it, but he helped with a housing co-op project in South Bend that accessed um, tax credits. So that's a new 
I shouldn't say new because that was several years ago. Tax credits are not easy to get, but this project was able to use tax credits and put this project together. Part of the issue is an understanding in the banking community about housing co-ops and how they operate and how they work. So if you're interested in this and can get your banker to attend as well, that's that's even better so that they have a better understanding. You know, it's not some fly-by-night strange business model out there. This is a business model that has been around for hundreds of years, very successful in, in not only housing but other sectors as well. Now, who's Jake? Uh, Jake Seip, he is the director of the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, and he helped the project in South Bend access those tax credits. I would really like to know about that because I've been told you can't use tax credits for housing co-ops. And I've fought that because I used to manage one here in the district that was funded with housing tax credits. So I knew it had happened in the past. And that was an 80s, 90s uh, a housing co-op. So I would like to know more recent how they use that. And I know Hugh Jeffers, who chairs the Development and Preservation Committee in the National Association of Housing Co-ops, <laughs> would love to know how to do that, too, because that is the main reason that more housing co-ops are not on the landscape funding. funding. So, yeah, I would love to know that. I won't be able to be there, but I would drive the Indianapolis to, figure, <laughs> to get that out. It's going to be recorded. Oh, great. Well, if when Durrell is speaking at 145, talking about financing, if Jake could talk about how they funded that through tax credit, that would be awesome. That's a huge, huge need. I'm a, NCB uh, funds that are funds development and also ongoing housing co-ops, both affordable and market rate. But having this, if we could get, if we could get these housing tax credits, that would be awesome. Listen, we only have a minute left, so what do you want to leave people with? The co-op business model is not some strange, crazy model. It works for almost any situation you can imagine. And there's not, it's not just a single entity. So I I guess what I'm trying to say is one of the things that we say in the co-op community is if you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op. Because... It changes from community to community, and the people who are involved in it create that co-op so it helps their individual needs. So it's just a really cool model that helps people help themselves. Help people help themselves, and very flexible if one co-op is one co-op based on the people. And the people decide what that co-op is going to look like, and they decide the policies and everything you've already talked about. Absolutely. Deb, thank you. Thank you for doing Up and Coming for Food Co-ops and now this Housing Co-op Conference. And everybody out there, uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperatively. News Talk 1450 WOLAM, where information is power.